Okay, good evening, everyone. This is Tuesday, June 23rd, 2020. We are having our work session uh, 5.30 um, for the uh, budget for outside agencies. Um, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. It's not on here. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, with that, we have quite a few agencies this evening, uh, and the chairs will be walking us through their presentations. Um, Jason Hilders, our Deputy City Manager, will uh, get us started. Thank you, Mayor, Commissioners. Um, I just bring to your attention here uh, the schedule for this evening. Uh, as you mentioned, we have several presentations uh, that were all part of the packet that went out uh, last week. Uh, we have uh, this order and tentative time schedule. Uh, we'll try to adhere to that the best we can. Uh, obviously, this is the first time we'll be doing this over Zoom. Uh, so I will have control over all the presentations and uh, each speaker then will join us and they won't have to share their screens. I'll be doing that. So we'll work through each of these entities and um, hopefully uh, be wrapped up around seven o'clock. So we'll jump right in. And I believe uh, Linda Nupp is with us with the library. And I will stop sharing this screen and start sharing uh, that presentation. in a second. Linda, you want to go ahead and introduce and I'll bring it right up. I sure will. Thank you, Jason. And uh, thank you for your time this evening. I'm Linda Nupp. I'm the director of the Manhattan Public Library. Um, and as we move forward, next screen, please, Jason. Mm -hmm. I'd like to recognize the members of the Manhattan Public Library Board of Trustees. Board members are appointed to four-year terms as defined in Kansas statutes. And um, the mayor also serves as a voting mayor, uh, member of the board. And uh, this year's uh, members include Elaine Shannon, Carrie Spencer, Tyler Darnell, Carolyn Elliott, Stacy Kohlmeyer, Medat Morcos, Jamie Morris Hardeman, and Mayor Reddy. Um, some of them are watching tonight. They would be in the room if this was being done in a different way. So, Kansas statute also defines the mechanism for public library funding, which is largely through property tax. And this includes the general fund and the employee benefit fund. Revenue from the general fund in 2021 will not increase from this year and will remain flat. No increases in salaries next year will allow for that flat budget while keeping up the cost of operating both services and maintaining our facility. While the city owns the facility, the library is entirely responsible for all of the expenses, the maintenance and upkeep of the building. So next slide, please, Jason. There is no increase next year in the employee benefit fund. If there are any increases in health insurance, capers, workers' compensation, unemployment insurance, those will all be absorbed from carryover from 2020. And we are working to reduce those expenses this year so that carryover will be available. A non-tax source of income are our grants, fines, fees, and interest. Um, and we anticipate a reduction in 2021 with reduced collection of overdue fines and an anticipated loss of income interest. $15,500 in state aid should remain steady and it is contingent on local maintenance of effort to not reduce local support. Next slide, please. The endowment funds account for 5% of revenue next year. The Manhattan Library Association, the Friends of the Library are a dedicated group of volunteers that work hard year round to support all of our program activity and income raised from funds this year and next will be impacted. We're really grateful that the book sale was in February this year. That made a big difference, but we really don't know what that might look like in 2021 at this point. And we have some work to do to figure out alternate ways to raise funds and we'll be 
looking at that in the days ahead. The Manhattan Library Foundation handles large gifts and will continue to support our collections, both print and digital, with our designated funds, as well as some projects that we have underway that are not supported by the general fund. Next slide, please. Projections indicate that the impact of the library budget on the mill rate will remain well under six mills as it has for over 20 years, and it will be a little under half of a mill from this year. The board has demonstrated good stewardship in keeping the mill under the six mill levy limit established in 1984 while providing the resources to operate a library that served the community well and is prepared to adapt and to change and move into the future. Next slide, please. This is a summary of all of the sources of revenue. And as you can see, the tax funds remain flat, but with losses and other accounts, the library's um, income for next year will be reduced by $65,500. The future is going to look different for a while anyway, as we all work through the challenges and changes that we've been experiencing. But the library's goals still remain relevant, even though the methods of delivering services have and will continue to change and adjust under these circumstances, as well as future developments. So, but just to kind of give you an idea of what's been happening, happening recently, during this period, staff have developed and presented over 20 online programs for children and teens. There's been several online programs for adults that include Zoom book discussions, and some Zoom instruction for residents of adult care homes to help them use new technologies to get their materials. Uh, over 300 children's books were distributed at a pop-up library event at the farmer's market thanks to funding from USD 383's K-Link grant that they received a year or two ago. And there'll be some additional pop-up library sites scheduled through the summer and we're looking forward to that. Our summer reading program is still going strong with online registration of over 1,300 people. That includes children, teens, and adults. And a quarter of those readers have already met their reading goals for the summer with still a month to go. Carryout service has provided a safe way for readers to get their hands on print books because people still miss their print materials in spite of a number of other ways to, to use library sources. Public computers and print and fax services are available with social distance measures for those who need access to technology for their job applications, for census filing, for tax filing and communication, and the increasing number of services moving online. It really is a critical time for people to have access to broadband internet and to devices. And, um, you know, moving forward, I hope the commission will keep that in mind if there's opportunities for citywide access. The exceptional collection of digital resources are available to card holders and include books, audiobooks, magazines, newspapers, music, streaming video, as well as a number of online training resources. Most recently, Creative Bug for crafters and artists, and Lynda.com for business people, computer people, technology training. For so many people who are new to a Zoom meeting, there's some fantastic tutorials on Lynda.com. There's a number, and some of these are even picture books for children like Tumble Books or Knowledge City for, again, business type um, training and classes. All of these are free with the Manhattan Public Library card. And we've seen a 77% increase in the use of our digital resources over this time last year. Staff have issued over 500 new e-cards remotely during this time and have made it maintain contact with our patrons by phone, chat, and email to help them use library resources and find the information they need. And this is our last slide. These are our 2019 use numbers that we report to the Institute of Museums and Library Services and the State Library of Kansas. So this shows pretty typical use, but this year has certainly not been typical. But services have continued and the library is prepared to meet the challenges in the month ahead or the months ahead to keep services safe and accessible. So that includes a basic review of the budget for 2021. And I thank you for your interest in the library. Thank you, Linda. Uh, Commissioner, are there any questions for Linda? Yeah. Yes, Mark. Commissioner Hattisall here. Um, 
what uh, what types of expenses have you been able to save on since you were closed for several weeks? I, I know you would hope to be a little bit less utilities. I, I suspect you paid your employees. Um, my, my, my just of my question generally is um, uh, if you were closed for several weeks, that should have been able to save a little bit of money, which should also help provide a little extra carryover cushion um, besides just uh, besides the $65,000 decrease, I was wondering what, what types of expenses did you notice that you did not have as much of during the time you were closed? Was you able to save on utilities or uh, the ship, shipping postage, any, any significant amount of money there? You know, Mark, I don't know that I can tell you specific line items. I can tell you that we um, did not purchase as many print materials dr during that time and we received a substantial grant from the 1998 Jack Goldstein Trust for some of the online resources. So we were able to transfer some of the print funds into the online resources to reduce waiting periods on materials. Digital resources are a whole new world for um, digital rights for publishers and access. So that, that presents some challenges, but we really did provide a substantial number of resources in that way. And I'll have to look at that. It's been shocking to me how much, much more money we've spent for hand sanitizer and cleaning supplies alone uh, when I look at our maintenance supply budget. And I haven't, I didn't, I haven't looked closely at, um, at the utilities. I think it was reduced somewhat, but we still had people coming in the building as much as possible to check on things, to make repairs as needed, to let pest control in. All of those things still went on at that level of building maintenance and there were some things that had to be addressed but i'll take a closer look at that um, as employees have we we did retain our employees and we were able to keep most working from home we have um, credit to our it group they've had an outstanding setup so that we can communicate at home have um, access to our own internal cloud our own internal communications and bulletin board and uh, many ways to access, access our files safely and make those transfers. Um, staff were able to take equipment home and record those story times and programs to show later. So there was a lot of activity going on even during closure, but still, as some people did leave, we haven't rehired for those positions until we need them. So I, that's one area I can identify. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, Linda, uh, I also wanted to say, uh, this is uh, Mayretti. Um, you mentioned hand sanitizer and such. One of the things, and I'm gonna say this to all of the uh, agencies that are gonna be speaking tonight, and I spoke to them earlier today and yesterday, that um, as the SPARC funds come to the counties and uh, Riley County gets about 14 to $15 million, uh, I highly suggest you itemize everything you've used related to COVID-19. Okay. You can get reimbursed for that. And also as you plan for future reopenings, whether it's face masks or hand sanitizers or face shields, whatever it might be COVID related. And that also goes to any kind of infrastructure you had to um, work on for COVID needs, whether it's IT or software, because I know you're very reliant on that to get your services to, the, um, to your membership. So anything like that, just keep track of. And uh, I appreciate that you are, you know, the library has always good, been good about the budget, uh, and it's important to keep the resources available for our community members. But I feel um, sad that one of the key components was the computer lab, where everybody would come and use your computers. And unfortunately, I wonder what those people are doing now if they don't have access to computers at home because they were using it for so many things. Uh, but other than that, um, I know you have a reopening policy, and I hope that's working well for you as well. We discussed it with Riley County Health Department today, and we'll probably take a, a half a step after last week's increase, but we can still get items to people. They can place holds on them through our catalog. They'll be able to pick them up at their convenience if they need staff to make some suggestions or uh, go pull items for, for them. We will do that with the physical items as well because that's still, books are still our brand for so many people. Um, one other thing I thought of, Mark, is we, you know, we haven't spent as much money out of our furnishings budget except for plexiglass. So, you know, it's just these trade-offs during this time that have been a trade-off of time 
not spent on one thing spent on another or not on one supply but another but i really appreciate um, being included in some of those purchases um, we're going to have a supply of masks on hand for for members of the public when they come in to use and to to keep our staff safe um, so that we can ensure that we have a workforce if one or two people and as people go out and move about the community it's certain that somebody will be exposed or be out for some time and so we have to plan for those things when we aren't up to full staffing as well those are all things under consideration at this time we've learned a lot of new skills we've learned a lot of interesting ways to do things in different ways and we're still learning those things sounds great thanks a lot linda thank um, you appreciate it is up next. Ann Smith will be talking about Adibus. Thank you uh, this evening for the opportunity to share uh, some updates and information about what we do and our funding request. You want to move forward please? One more. Thank you. Um, our mission really in, in a nutshell is to empower people and connect communities. That's what we do. Uh, whether it's our citywide fixed routes here in Manhattan and Junction City, as well as our regional services, uh, the K-18 connector, our Wamigo shuttle, or our demand response services throughout Riley, Gary, and Pottawatomie counties. I would like to talk this evening with you about uh, Manhattan citywide fixed routes. Uh, prior to the issues we've had with COVID, uh, we've had a uh, 175% increase in ridership since our route realignment that happened in 2018. Uh, we were very excited and, and very pleased with uh, how ridership has been growing. Uh, we've seen a significant increase in ridership on the Manhattan citywide fixed routes. It is now 44% of our total uh, ridership. Uh, in 2018, it was 27%, so that's a significant increase there as well. And then uh, what we, just as a brief reminder, um, we uh, did a route realignment in 2018 where we looked to uh, efficiently reevaluate all the routes. We sought to reduce bus mileage. We also needed to operate all of the routes year-round and provide more direct connections uh, from east to west. We've had a lot of very positive feedback from the public uh, and we really got a lot of direction from them as we were doing the route realignment and it, uh, I think the ridership speaks for itself that it has, uh, it has been very successful. Uh, one of the things that we really wanted to make a concerted effort to was to uh, create more opportunity and accessibility. So within a five minute walk of uh, an out of bus bus stop, we've increased the number of residences, uh, apartments, dorms and mobile homes, businesses, grocery stores, medical services and social services throughout Manhattan. And then we took a snapshot for you from uh, July through December. Uh, we're on the state fiscal year, so we're uh, June 30 is our fiscal year. <clears throat> we uh, were on track prior to uh, the issues we encountered in March with COVID of uh, having a record number of rides uh, in the Manhattan citywide fixed routes for this fiscal year. Uh, and. Uh, exceeding significantly our total number of ridership from the previous year as well. And these, these are some of the uh, trip generators, gives you an idea of where uh, people are going. Uh, the union continues to be a significant uh, trip generator. I would, uh, I would mention that West Loop has really uh, boomed with the new routes and it is now one of our highest trip generators as well. Uh, Walmart continues to be a big trip generator as well as Gramercy area over by the football stadium and hospital. 
So I want to talk a little bit about some of the local benefits that public transportation brings to the community. We've worked with uh, K-State. Uh, we uh, sponsored a design studio and uh, they designed a bus shelter for us and MATC is currently right now in the process of fabricating uh, one of the, we have three bus shelters on order and we, we were recognized by Kansas Public Transit Association and received an innovation award for our design and our work with um, K-State and with MATC. But we've also been working with city staff and we have uh, applied for federal transit funds and we're bringing funding for infrastructure improvements to Manhattan. And we have two pro projects in particular that we want to uh, talk about. So we have uh, projects in the 600 block of points and Fremont North Manhattan area. We're working with city staff. We've been able to bring nearly a million dollars in federal funds that will help to increase access to uh, bus stops and sidewalks and also just overall um, work with the city staff as they're trying to keep up and maintain and improve city infrastructure. Our project at North Manhattan and Fremont we're excited about because that has some rain gardens in the planning and so we're really uh, looking forward to those. I would like to talk to you a little bit about CARES Act funding. We've also been uh, fortunate enough to receive CARES Act funding through the Federal Transit Administration for our urban and rural services. For our urban services, we were awarded $2.8 million. And we decided that what we wanted to do uh, with the advice of our board uh, was that we wanted to return funding from our local partners for this year. And so through uh, speaking with Riley County, with the city staff, and with K-State, there are three largest local funding sources in Manhattan. Uh, we are uh, returning uh, awards for 2020 from uh, beginning March, or I'm sorry, April 1st through the end of this year. We're returning all of our funding. So our funding for originally was $129,882. And we uh, are only collected from the city a, our first quarter payment of $32,741. And then in uh, uh, the calendar year 2021, we are uh, volunteering to reduce our funding requests by 25%. And that's throughout uh, all of our funding partnerships in Manhattan with Riley County, K-State as well. So in total, we'll be uh, returning over $300,000 to the community uh, throughout our service areas, including in the rural program as well. And we felt this was a really important way that we could contribute to the challenges that our communities are facing uh, at this time. One other thing I wanna mention to you, uh, be, through this whole process, uh, public transit is identified as an essential service. And so I just want to give you a little update on our employees. Uh, in fiscal year 2020, uh, our employees living in Manhattan have earned nearly a million dollars. And that's money that's going back into our community that's supporting families throughout Manhattan. And during uh, this pandemic, uh, we have been able to ensure that our employees did not lose any wages during COVID-19 as a result of route reductions that we've uh, had to implement. And additionally, in the month of April, we did temporarily increase wages for all of our employees as well. So we're very grateful for that CARES Act uh, funding and it's, it's made sure that all of our employees have been able to uh, have a paycheck throughout this very challenging time. You wanna, okay. Um, again, the people riding the bus during this time, 
it's been very challenging. Uh, we have seen significant decrease in ridership. It has begun in the last few weeks to start to tick back up again. We increased our level of service uh, from where we were a few weeks ago, but we're still being very cautious. Uh, but the people that are using those services really need them. And whether they're going to doctor's appointments or they're getting groceries or they have jobs uh, that are essential service jobs, that's really important and uh, we want to continue to be there for them. I will tell you that we are offering to anybody that gets on board the bus, we're offering uh, reusable masks as well as uh, little miniature hand sanitizers for anybody that wants those. Um, and we've been working as well with the Senior Center. We currently, there's a federal waiver that allows us to help social services doing non-traditional public transit tasks. So currently we're working with the Senior Center and we're helping them to deliver uh, Meals on Wheels, the Friendship Meals, um, so that some of their volunteers don't have to get out and uh, put themselves in harm's way. So I really appreciate the opportunity to visit with you. I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. And thank you for all the hard work that you're doing. I know it's not an easy time for any of us right now, and especially you uh, folks on the commission who are really faced with a lot of challenging decisions. Thank you, Ann. Uh, commissioners, any questions for Ann Smith this evening? This is Commissioner Esterbrook. I'll just uh, comment that uh, really it's so helpful to have that CARES funding uh, to come back. And uh, I know that was that was a shock to me uh, when I first saw that coming through a few what, month or so ago that that might be the reality. And just uh, really really thankful for that and appreciate uh, you guiding that into our direction. Thank you. Um, this is Mayor Reddy. Um, and I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, K-State had put out a press release, I don't remember if it was last week or so, that they were going to turn completely to add a bus uh, for students um, for public transportation. I didn't know they had another avenue for public transportation. Can you just tell me a little bit more about uh, how much more it will be utilized or what your expectation is from sure. that? So I think you're referencing the Student Access Center. Yes. Um, they, uh, we've had a partnership with them for about 10 years now. Uh, they used to, 10 plus years ago, they had a vehicle that they would use to transport students with disabilities uh, on campus. And we started working with them and kind of slowly transported more and more students for them. They maintained a golf cart that they would uh, pick up that maybe uh, were really quick and there was a short turnaround and we weren't able to respond that quickly. Uh, the only thing that really has changed uh, is, uh, from my perspective, the biggest change is SAC won't continue to gatekeep the eligibility of those students. Uh, if they have a need, they will direct them to us we will have, if they're not able to use the fixed routes, we will ask them to fill out some paperwork so that we can transport them using demand response services. Uh, but that's, it's, it's a very small change, really. I know it's, um, there's been quite a reaction to that, but we've been working with them for a very long time and we have good partnerships. And I know that we can call upon Jason and his staff if we have any uh, need to consult with them on any situation that might arise. And all of our stops up on campus that are, uh, were SAC stops, and when I say that, that means they're all kind of vetted through SAC and they're all ADA accessible. Uh, so we would continue to talk to them and, and get advice from them if any situation arose that we needed their guidance. Terrific. Uh, my second question is, 
you know, uh, there's a lot of individuals that use Atibus uh, to go to doctor's appointments. Do you mm -hmm. see an increase in that or an increase in that at all? We're, that we're starting to see ridership tick back up. Um, we have not um, impre increased capacity on buses. We have still are, have reduced by 50% capacity on the buses. It's something we're watching very carefully. Um, we, we really, uh, given the confined spaces in a bus, it's important for us to try to maintain that six feet as much as possible in buses, and that's why we're really um, trying to encourage people to wear the masks on the bus. Uh, K-State, I know you are aware, they are now mandating masks on campus. So our drivers will start wearing masks if they happen to be driving on campus. So it's a very fluid situation, but um, I, I think we're all kind of we're learning as we go through this together. So I guess what I was trying to see is I want to assure everybody to still make their medical appointments because that's so important. Sometimes oh, absolutely. Yes. No. If if you need to go to the doctor, please give us a call. Yeah. That's what we're there for. Sounds great. Thank you, Ann. Thank you. Our next, uh, I didn't know, is Jason doing this one? Um, next presenter is Aggieville Business District. Oh, sorry, uh, Manhattan Arts Center. And I believe Penny's uh, stuff was going to be presenting. I just want to um, comment before Penny gets started. Uh, it says Brian Niehoff is president of the board on this. Um, Brian is my husband and he is no longer on the board of directors, so therefore he is not present either, just to remove any kind of conflict of interest people might think there is here. With that, Penny, go ahead and get started. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Sorry. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you. Um, it's a very trying time for everybody and um, I just wanted to show you something different from what I usually start with. This is how our uh, performance hall usually looks when we don't have COVID. Uh, we usually seat about 150 and for our big musicals and for kids shows, um, for some of the birdhouse acoustic music concerts, those seats are full. Um, but obviously, uh, we can't do that right now. This is from the Adams Family, which was one of those big musicals I mentioned. Um, the, our musicals, when we, when we do things like Adams Family, we were going to be doing The Sound of Music. Um, we, we may be able to do it in the fall, but who knows. Those usually um, bring in about ten to $12,000, and there's no way that we can uh, do that right now. Um, so we're just going to do the best with what we have. Um, what you're seeing now is a gallery exhibit. It was the last one that we had. This is, was a collaboration with Jerry uh, Craig at, uh, at K-State. It was the um, Earl Project. Um, it was actually, it was up in our gallery for a long time because we couldn't get in to get it down. Um, this is our violin program for small kids. It's been very popular. It's been going uh, in town, not all, we, not all the time with us, obviously, but for over 30 years. Um, this was one of the programs that we had to uh, cancel, postpone. Uh, there are many programs that we could put online, um, but this is one where you just can't, if you, if you need to show a small child who's just picked up a violin where to put their fingers, you can't do that online. So. Unfortunately, this one had to get cancelled. Um, Empty Bowls is a project that we do with the community, uh, with the Manhattan Nonviolence Initiative. We make our studio space available, we make clay available um, at no cost, um, and also the firing, which can be quite expensive. Um, and it, it benefits um, um, Common Table and also uh, Cat's Cupboard. Um, so we actually still have a lot of bowls at the, at the office because we couldn't complete this project. I think we're still going to be able to make a donation of about uh, $1,200 to, 
to that where it's not strictly speaking from us, it's from people who come in and um, make bowls and, um, and then come in and make a donation to, to get those bowls. Um, so we had to do some things differently. The community school um, is uh, mostly um, K-State professors and instructors, so they were already doing things online, offering lessons online. So that actually continued fairly well. The thing we had to do with the community school because of um, overall income being lower, we had to reduce the, cut the scholarships that we're offering. We usually offer a substantial amount in scholarships so that um, people who are lower down the income scale, scale can still come in and take these classes, these lessons with uh, um, K-State faculty. Um, the Manhattan Experimental Theatre has always been in person in our theatre. Uh, this year we said, okay, you need to be really experimental. So they did, they did a lot of research and figured out how to do it all online. Uh, they used Google Classroom and then they did uh, a Zoom performance that, that went up on YouTube. So um, I was really happy that that was able to, to, to go. And what we did this year since uh, when we actually started putting out the word about it, the high school was already not, the students were not there anymore. So we opened it up to um, alums of the program. So we actually had a really good number of students in the program. Um, they had to have obviously done the program before and they did two, uh, I think, very successful performances just last weekend. Um, so, uh, as Linda mentioned, for the library, we have had to learn a lot. Um, so we've been doing a lot of webinars. Um, one of the best sources for webinars has been the American Association of Community Theatre, who offered workshops on all kinds of different things, not necessarily just related to uh, theatre. Um, but people always say, well, why don't you just stream your production? Um, unfortunately, it's not quite that easy. The author has to agree to that, not the publishing company. Um, so, but finding out about all that, finding out about insurance, um, it, the webinars have taken a lot of time, and I think sometimes staff are getting a little tired of doing another webinar, but um, they've been fantastic about saying yes, they would do it, learning stuff, and then we always try to bring it back to the, the whole staff so that we are all learning something from those webinars. Um, we did do one Zoom play. Uh, it was a play that was adapted for Zoom by the author, um, and this was a performance. Um, he actually did it, he, he allowed us to present it um, on Zoom without any royalty, which was terrific. So we've been, we've been looking at more Zoom plays. Of course, usually we'll have to pay royalties, but that's absolutely fine. That's what, what the author needs to get. So I showed you on the top left here, that's what we used to look like. This is what we look like right now. We do have some day camps going, some art day camps. Uh, we are not doing the very small children, but we do have, um, I think it's age six and up. Um, we have more staff so that they get checked in by someone and we have a check-in procedure with um, taking temperatures, making sure that everyone's okay. And the kids are being fantastic about keeping to their chair, their number. They have a number where they can put their, their things, where they can then they go sit on their chair. Um, and so far, it has gone remarkably well. Of course, if we can't get any more seats than this to do um, musicals, plays, uh, that's going to be a huge chunk of income that we lose. Um, this is our little entryway when you come in. Uh, get your temperature taken. This is all following CDC um, guidelines. Um, doing a little self-check, hand sanitizer, um, and people have been really good about doing this. Um, we've, we've got everyone documented who comes in, and I'm very grateful to the uh, Greater Manhattan Community Foundation because they provided they provided the hand sanitizer stand and a big bottle of hand sanitizer the, the um, some thermometers and various other supplies, gloves and wipes, which uh, we are going through quite fast. Uh, but it's, it's okay, it's because people are using them, so that's great. 
Um, this is the season that we hope to present, um, but we have found obviously that we need to be flexible and keep changing. So we changed our summer musical to this comedy, Banyan, Zonyan, Masha and Spike. Um, so that, that's actually in rehearsal. Instead of the, the musical we were gonna be doing, we will see when we get to the sound of music if we can actually put on a musical. Uh, we may need to postpone that one again. Um, but this, this was the plan um, for this upcoming season anyway. I then have a couple of um, pie charts for you to see what's been going on. Um, the class registration fees are still pretty good, uh, but you can see that, that the admissions have dropped down to 10% um, instead of 15%. Uh, and that's going to continue to hurt us quite a lot. Um, these, what the, sorry. <laughs> what the, um, the income from big musicals in particular, and also to some extent the, the help that you give us, it helps fund things like uh, programs, cultural programs that go into the schools, uh, young people's concerts, um, instrument repair for Ogden, um, and just providing scholarships for all sorts of programs for um, low income families. So. Uh, we'll need to see how we can work that out. We did get a pay, uh, payroll protection um, loan for just uh, around 45,000, um, and that was going through June. Um, that, that's been fantastic, so we have been able to pay all our staff so far. We also received a $20,000 um, grant from the Kansas Creative Arts Industries Commission that will, will come um, in our next fiscal year, which starts on July the 1st. Um, this is our expenses, obviously, and you can see that um, salaries and wages have um, zipped up a bit. Um, uh, in uh, the last, oh, so this current fiscal year, sorry, that ends at the end of this month, we did also receive a $50,000 uh, anonymous donation and a $25,000 bequest. So um, that's been very helpful in making sure that this fiscal year we are in, in pretty good shape, but um, it's gonna be tough next year. This is just a direct comparison of uh, income and expenses. So for FY19, it looks quite good. And you can see for FY20, when we get to April and uh, March and April, it's way down. Um, I'm hoping that that will go up a little bit in June. We do have a fundraiser that's coming up in August, and so far we've had a really good response to our request for sponsors. It is gonna be a virtual fundraiser, which is something completely different for us. So uh, we're working on that, have a really good committee, and um, we'll see what we can do. But I think the, the main theme for the coming year for us is going to be trying new things. We may not do big productions, we may do more small readings or smaller plays. Um, we'll have to see what we do about music. We're gonna be doing more local music, assuming that we can do music at all. Um, but one of the things I did want to mention is that many of our programs are, I think, unique in the area. Uh, people come to us because they can't get these anywhere else. So um, your support is very much appreciated. And I do know that uh, it is going to go down because because of the source that we're funded from, but we really appreciate any help that you can give us this coming for us fiscal year from July 1st, uh, 2020 to um, to June 30th, 2021. So I think that was all I had. Does anyone have any questions I can answer? Yeah, questions for Penny or comments. Looks like there isn't any. Thank you, Penny. We appreciate uh, the presentation this evening. Thank I know you. it's challenging, but uh, we'll see what we can do. Thanks. Next presenter is the Aggieville Business District, Dennis Cook, Executive Director. Good evening, Dennis. Hi, how are you? Can you hear me now? Yes, you can. Okay. Um, well, 
thank you, everybody. I, I appreciate the time this evening. Uh, before I begin, I, I'd just like to maybe address the uh, recent spike in the positive COVID cases. Uh, Aggieville does draw a lot of attention. We know that. And, but that's because we draw a lot of people, all age groups, but especially that under 30 crowd for dining and socializing. I, my hope is just that you can differentiate between cause and effect. I think we're just a, um, we are a draw. People like to come that way. I'm not sure that, that anybody has ever even uh, implied that we're a cause, but we are just one of the places that people show up. So uh, we are really hoping that uh, this current trend reverses. Uh, now, I'll just jump into the, uh, the our, our funding request. And okay, um, I'll just summarize this. Uh, we are uh, we're requesting uh, $60,000 towards our standard operating budget. This is the same amount that we've, uh, we've asked for in 2018, 2019, and 2020. We've got a lot of stuff going on. We've, got, we've shown some tremendous improvement this year. And uh, we continue to strive to be the best shopping district in Manhattan for, for the locals, visitors, and the, and the temporary residents coming through. Um, we've, got, we've maintained our consistent leadership this year, and we remain focused on our future. Our board, which you'll see coming up, uh, consists of nine strong business leaders who serve the community in a variety of ways on, on, on other boards also. We're, uh, we're excited to get the, the launch of the new Aggieville Vision Projects are finally getting going, and that's great. Uh, we continue to enhance our maintenance programs, uh, work on our community events, and promote Aggieville to visitors and residents. Uh, the rest of this you will see as we, as we go along, uh, but I just do want to jump down to say that we, will believe, we believe that the uh, continuous and ongoing improvements in Aggieville are going to help drive economic growth for the region and meet the community's desire for a more vibrant shopping, dining, and entertainment district. Next slide, please. Uh, this, is our, this is our proposed 2021 budget. Uh, I'm sure you had a chance to possibly look at that, but uh, our ordinary income, uh, the uh, ABID or the, uh, uh, the Business Improvement District Funds, that's, a, uh, that's, a, that's always our best guess. It is at seventy-one thousand. Same thing was a was a, with associate members dues. Our best guess is uh, hopefully we can do eight thousand, and then with your with your money uh, that would make it one thirty-nine. Our ordinary expenses are um, are just payroll, which leaves us with a net income net ordinary income of seventy-one, and the other type of expenses shows how we spend the seventy-one thousand dollars. So um, we're work, we're working at it pretty hard. Um, Aggieville, you know our slogan, it's come early, stay late. We, uh, uh, we've been around since 1889 and we're the oldest shopping district in Kansas and, and we, have, we are the home to over 100 businesses. Uh, this is just a, a quick look at our board members uh, uh, through, our, through our officers, our board at large, and then just three of us on the staff, that's myself and, and my two marketing interns. Um, our objectives for 2021, uh, and we'll see this as we scroll through, but uh, adding a carefully planned parking solution. That's been the, uh, the number one issue for Aggieville for as long as I've been around, which is uh, uh, quite a few years, uh, where it looks like we're about to get that thing fixed. Uh, more working and living opportunities, uh, continued cleanliness to attract families, and, uh, and then have uh, favorable community projects that really impact the city well. Uh, our parking solution, um, you know, that the picture on the left is the uh, is the proposed parking garage for the uh, the corner of North Manhattan and Laramie, and uh, that was just uh, really approved here in about the last three weeks. This is going to be a huge improvement for us. Uh, besides parking, for I think the last estimate I saw was 452 parking spaces. Uh, there will also be uh, approximately you know, somewhere between eight and ten thousand dollars worth. Uh, 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 eight, I'm sorry, seven to, seven to eight thousand uh, eight thousand square feet of commercial space. And then the picture on the right shows the, the gap between the new parking garage and what was the Rally House building, and how that will be designed 
to be a, a, a positive piece and not just some dark, dank alley. On the uh, working and living side, um, more work and living opportunities. Um, uh, as everybody, you know, if you if you choose to drive by Aggieville, there's a lot of construction going on. Uh, but but the uh, apartments, uh, between the apartments and things uh, uh, on, on our north side, uh, we're adding a lot of people living in our area. Uh, you know, we've got a we've changed some zoning so we can go up to to five stories on, on our outskirts, maintaining the integrity of the uh, inside of Aggieville. And then the picture on the right is the uh, property in, that's just south of the Burger King at 14th in Laramie. And um, and I know that uh, when the city made their presentation on the garage, they've had contact and, and I know that their, their, their plans are still to go ahead with this project. They're kind of timing it more to uh, about the same time that our parking garage finishes. But that will be another big uh, enhancement for Aggieville. Uh, from a cleanliness standpoint, uh, we're continuing to do what we uh, everything that we can we can do. We have a permanent, part-time employee that that's down here five nights a week, working on it all the time. Um, the picture on the right shows the flower baskets, and we do uh, we do a contract with with uh, with a, a local landscaping company to to have uh, great flowers uh, on these flower baskets on these poles all the way through Aggieville. And then uh, community projects. Uh, we want to do the, the right things for people. The, the picture on the left, obviously, is is our uh, our annual trick or treat event that, that brings between three and four thousand kids down here. It is it's huge. We time that to go with uh, K State's homecoming parade. Uh, we we have not, that's this this one we haven't failed on yet that we've had uh, consistently every October and we plan on it again this year. Uh, also in the fall, uh, in December, we do the uh, Mayor Spirit of the Holiday Lighted Parade and the, uh, and the tree lighting ceremony with, with everything down here at Triangle Park. And then we do Little Apple New Year's Eve uh, in the spring. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get to have the St. Patrick's Day Parade this year, but that's, that's been a standard for over 40 years for us. Uh, in April, we had planned a, a, a first time event. We we're gonna do a livestock show and uh, that was going to be an amazing piece of a piece of uh, a promotion for us, and, and we are going to planning on bringing that back this next year. Um, and uh, really, for next year, we are also taking a lead role in uh, in bringing guests into Manhattan. By uh, we're going to take the uh, uh, main sponsorship piece of working hard to bring back the, all the Manhattan High School alumni reunion all classes all years back on one weekend so uh, we've got uh, you know we're we're actively working with a group on that and uh, that's a big piece of, uh, of bringing people back into Manhattan uh, one more other event that I would mention that we're working on it's maybe not an event but we are working with uh, with university uh, specifically Cheryl Grice at this moment on a drive to zero program trying to help out, uh, you know, find the best way to, to uh, stop uh, any drinking and driving. And uh, we're, we're actually making some good headway with, with Uber and, and working with Cheryl on that. So we have things going on. I would say with, uh, with that, I would maybe try to get you back on track, but you can, I'd also stand for any questions you have. Thanks a lot, Dennis. Uh, commissioners, are there questions or comments for Dennis? Okay, seeing that. Uh, Dennis, so I have a couple of questions for you. Um, other than the bars and restaurants, which we hear quite a bit about, how are the other businesses doing in Aggieville? Is there a lot of foot traffic? Is there uh, people coming and going? Is are they doing? Are they doing okay? Is my question. It, it appears that we really are. I think that uh, you know what I hear is uh, business has been actually a little bit better than normal at this time of year. So there's uh, there's a lot of people getting out and supporting these businesses. That it's been really well, really well done. Okay, and uh, I know you have uh, activities and such planned. And how has the parking been? I know we haven't had as many people coming into Manhattan. But uh, with the construction and all the con, um, 
you know, blocks that we have, uh, orange cones we have all over the place. How is how are you all handling that? Well, um, it, it, if there is a silver lining to everything that's going on, it's been because the uh, a lot uh, all the uh, the big number of students haven't been around. Parking has been fine. If uh, if anybody wants to come down, they have been able to find parking. Now we're going to run into we're obviously going to run into trouble uh, when when the fall semester starts. Uh, we will see some issues there, and then uh, in October, when the uh, 80 stalls of parking next to Rally House goes under construction, we will have a a, 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 a distress flag flying. So we're going to have to uh, be a lot more creative about how we get people down here. Uh, I know we're going to have the e-scooters. Uh, we're anxious to work with everybody on how the, how that works for us, but. Um, you know, we know it's a little bit of a growing pain, but we're doing fine right now, and hopefully we can we can maintain through the fall. Okay, thank you. Seeing no more questions, um, we will move on to Gina. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Sorry. Good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Uh, Gina Scruggs from downtown uh, will we'll take over. Go ahead, Gina. Great, thank you. Um, I sure wish that we were face to face. I, I always preferred that because I feel like this is our one time of year where we really get to highlight and shine and talk about the great things that are going on, um, discuss issues, but here we are. So um, I do wanna thank uh, publicly, Jason Hilgers has been just absolutely amazing with his education to all of us on the board and to me especially. Um, there were a lot of things that he had to teach me through this time of crisis and I just really appreciate that. Also to you Mayor for your expressed concern for our district and uh, Commissioner Butler. Every week you called and asked us how we were doing and I really really appreciate that. So I want to thank you for your leadership through this time of crisis. It's been really important to us. At every year we um, highlight a city employee that has been a really excellent steward to downtown and just because this is a different weird strange time I don't want to get away from that because uh, the city of Manhattan has an employee and Jason if you want to move to the next slide that's awesome I want to thank Brian Johnson the city engineer for absolutely everything that he has done for downtown over the last 12 months um, he's just really been uh, helpful in, in helping us get through the open air market and outdoor dining, logistical codes, legal side of things. Um, he's helped us navigate the stormwater uh, construction project that's really on the border of, of the downtown district and just really communicating with us when we have these little temporary ordinances that we need in place in order to help a business or or patrons like a temporary loading zone um, during our heavy heavy construction he's just been instrumental and we just really appreciate his friendship and and the fact that he values us as a district has been awesome so I wanted to take time to to say that we are uh, obviously all in the middle of our reopening and uh, while it's been stressful and surreal we've tried to use the same practices that we use every day for small business growth uh, we've, we've tried to implement the same kinds of uh, cautious and um, steady and even keeled practices that we do when there's not a crisis so we are working our way through um, this different, really different time. We want everyone to come into our neighborhood and be safe. We want them to have a safe and enjoyable experience. And we want to stress that we would also like, as, as the employees downtown, we would also like to have an enjoyable experience. So we just encourage everybody to do their best to stay safe and hopefully we can continue to move successfully through this reopening process. So this is just a quick glance at downtown by the numbers. Um, we go June 2019 through June of 2020, just so that you have a one year snapshot. 
Um, as you can see from our annual survey numbers, 2019 was a great year for us. Obviously, the first and second quarter of 2020 were not great for generating revenue, um, but we did see a steady, we did have steady growth in our job creation. That's new jobs created, 161 new jobs created in our district. Our commercial and residential occupancy has really just remained the same, which is such a blessing for seven years straight. Our number of employees district-wide has pretty much stayed in the same range. And um, obviously we are always proud of our contribution towards sales tax and property tax. Even, even in the, the waning years, um, which it's been down a couple of years in a row, as you all are very familiar, we, we still are um, very proud to be a part of that really important contribution. So um, I hope you have an opportunity to look, really look at this. This is my favorite piece of information. I think it really shows our health um, and our economic vitality. Um, it's, our, it's our good news slide. And we really have had an excellent um, 2019. And, and even in this horrible, horrible time of, of the stay at home order and the virus and, and being really uncertain, we've also had a lot of really great um, really measurable, quantifiable uh, growth happening in our district. Um, we've had 14 new businesses open in the last 12 months, and uh, two of those businesses are going to open. Uh, one's going to open in July, and the other one is going to open in October that we know of, and we have a couple on the horizon that we can't, we're not 100% sure about, but looking good there. Um, we did have three businesses move out of the district and uh, two businesses of ours did close due to COVID. Um, unfortunately, that's, luckily for us, they weren't small businesses. Um, they are, were associated with franchise. So uh, I don't know, maybe that's not luckily, but I'm, I'm really uh, pleased that we, we didn't, um, have any more losses due to COVID. So this is a net gain of nine new businesses and is on track with the last seven years of our growth and progress. Uh, we had three existing businesses downtown that expanded into larger spaces. This to me is always a really good indicator of how well things are going in our district. Uh, especially when they choose to stay in our district and purchase a building and renovate that building or renovate a space, I, I feel like that's a, a good way to show measurable uh, economic health. Um, we've had four major building renovations and they're basically taking place right now in our district. Uh, I'm sure you know the southwest west corner of Fourth and Points uh, has been undergoing renovations for about a year. We're gonna see some movement on that building um, in July. So that they're cleaning up the sidewalk and getting ready to um, move on to their next project. 416 points, um, which is where the Manhattan Brewing Company is going. They're getting ready to open on July 8th. 314 points, which is formerly Wiesner So Unique, So, so Unique, um, is was purchased by Astor House Designs and the Furnish Company, and she just had her meet and excuse me her meet and greet, and uh, we're really excited for her to open in October. And then, of course, as you all know, the Community House is going to start; it's going to break ground next week. So, we're really excited about all of those businesses, and I think it's again, like I said, a good indicator of of uh, and measurable growth. So, our goals and initiatives um, and objectives we put this together as a board every year. The green highlighted um, items we did in March of this year when, when the stay at home order went into effect because we knew we had to shift and pivot as every other business did. So it's all self-explanatory. I won't go through any all of these one at a time just to say that um, everything in green was newly added for, for our goals and tasks. And so our job, we just got busier. So our current uh, situation is um, we, we have actually have a shortfall for 2020. 
because we um, receive our funding allocation from the TGT fund, we do not expect to receive our July and October um, contract payments. So that gives us a shortfall of $32,000 this year. And uh, after releasing our event manager and cutting back my administrative assistants hours, cutting back our groundskeepers hours, and really just scaling back to bare bones, um, we ha currently have funds that allow us to operate through October of this year. After that, um, we don't have funds. So uh, the, the, without those funds, DMI will cease to exist. And uh, I think it goes without saying that, that without that, you lose your small business advocacy, certainly the protection of the $200 mil million dollar investment that's been made over the last 30, 35 years, liaison, being a liaison for mutual concerns and initiatives. I mean, just a lot goes away when, when if DMI were not to be here. Um, if we do get our funding in July and October of this year, I think um, we would, well, I know we would like to do what we can working with the current orders and the public health situation to bring back some normalcy. Uh, I think this is gonna be, in the next couple of years are gonna be the years of highlighting staycations. And I think that we should jump on our regional drop and the fact that people like to come to Manhattan if we can offer some low key, uh, easy going, socially enjoyable, but socially distant events in the downtown neighborhood, I think um, we can generate some revenue down here. Of course, you know, mass gathering numbers need to go up a little bit more and, and we need to get back into the good column with, with our health situation. But uh, we are definitely looking forward to our open air market programming to come to fruition, our outdoor dining. We'd love to see outdoor dining with alcohol. We want our, we'd like, love to be able to do third Thursdays and maybe just in September, um, our annual sidewalk sales in July, all treats day, pink up the pace, our breast cancer research run, our 5K in October, the mayor's spirit of the holiday parade, our carriage rides, I mean, that's all out there looming. We've done these events enough to have a grasp. I think if we remain flexible, we can uh, jump in there and pull something off, even if it has to have modifications. But we have to have funding in order to do it. And um, this 2020 revised budget here shows what we need to be able to do to continue through the end of the year. So with our 2021 funding request, we are asking for the same that we asked for last year, which is uh, $78,000, but we have a two-pronged approach to this. The first approach is trying to understand what 2020 would look like uh, with maybe quarter one just going sideways um, and the rest of the year being being better and being okay. We would want to be able to pull off all of our events and we would need to hire an event person back or um, if we can't have an event professional, then we at the very least need to have some uh, event staff at, at, a lo at lower wages to help us pull off our 16 annual events. Um, and we obviously need to maintain the care and keeping that we've always done with our with our downtown from our groundskeeping and our flower baskets and our Christmas lights and our flag program with the Masons, everything that we, we do, um, especially aesthetically, I think no matter what happens, that needs to happen because if you take that away and it starts to look visually like doom and gloom, I think it, it'll feed into uh, worrisome, maybe even panic. Um, so I think it's really important that we, we keep up with our cleanliness and the, and the way that we, that we look, the way that people are used to us looking. Uh, the secondary approach for us would be um, including a, a fairly sizable marketing campaign should the virus um, cause major restrictions um, we would need to be able to help our small businesses start utilizing e-commerce, educate the public about how shopping local can be done online. 
I think we all learned how well that can be done when MHK Together came out with their gift card program. Everybody jumped on board and bought gift cards and supported local business. I think we would need to have a sizable campaign should some of our businesses have to close that would help the public understand that they can still purchase items from retailers. They can do business with insurance and banks online. Um, but we would need to help our businesses be able to do that with, with the campaign. We would, in addition to that, we and, and having to modify our events, we would need to um, obviously have the funds to be, we're gonna probably, it's possible, we would lose a lot of our thousands of dollars in sponsorships. So we're gonna need to, uh, even with modifications, in order to pull off any of our events, be able to, to um, have funding to do it. So that's our sort of, I hope you can see the two paths that we're sort of setting up for. Um, one is, for lack of a better use of terms, business as usual, although, I don't know, it's hard. I mean, I'm sure you all are totally aware of how hard it is to plan for this. And the second idea being this big shift in small business advocacy and how we can really, in the, in the first mode, it's really giving our patrons what they're used to. And the second mode is giving our businesses what they need to stay alive. That's kind of how I'm, I'm looking at the 2021 planning and 2021 business uh, budget. I'm sorry, I hope that makes sense to you guys. Do you have questions? Yeah, thank you, Gina. Uh, that was very well done. Commissioners, do you have any comments for Gina or questions? I don't, don't have any questions. I, I, I appreciate, you know, what DMI and Aggieville does, especially as Gina brought out the, the aesthetics of it, you know, just things that people maybe don't appreciate, baskets, lights, you know, things of that nature. It makes a big difference on, on attitude, you know, when, when, when people are, are down there. And, and I just hope, uh, you know, the, the chamber and the two business districts continue to work together as much as possible to, to help us uh, remedy some of the drawbacks on the economic impact of the, of the virus. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Wen. Um, Gina, I think uh, hopefully the uh, money that we partnered up with the Manhattan Chamber has also helped out some of the DMI businesses. Um, I think, uh, you know, I've mentioned this to other organizations that are here and I will continue to mention as Riley County figures out how they're going to distribute the money. You know, you gave us this, um, your goals and objectives in green and blue. I would just put a little few more bullet points under each of those and see what you did. Uh, like when you say work with recovery force task force or seeking grants and all like so that everything that's been utilized for COVID-19 if it's documented you know you should try to get reimbursement for that mm -hmm. and I hope the um, outdoor dining that we approved hopefully that'll go well but even if you're having to purchase things differently if your businesses have to purchase other things different just to accommodate outside dining because of COVID-19, uh, encourage them to itemize all of that. Okay. Because if they're not for COVID-19, they wouldn't have to do that. Okay, uh, good to know. Sanitizers, PPE, just even tables, chairs, uh, whatever it might be. But yeah, uh, we, we actually didn't anticipate or we didn't know really obviously in the beginning how that we were gonna be compelled to supply uh, our businesses with masks and uh, hand sanitizer, disinfectant, but we, we obviously we wanted to and needed to and so we did we found a way to do that but yes that was part of that's also built into our 2021 budget because we want them to be successful and we want them to thrive and to build that consumer confidence you're going to need all of those safety measures so yep. people will come out and want to dine and do all that they do out there um, have you thought about the e-scooters that we just um, we'll be getting you know they have the contract has downtown discuss that and what do you think about it we haven't talked about it recently jared and i had a brief conversation um i think we we understand that the e-scooters are going to be downtown i don't want them on the sidewalks although just this evening i walked past two of them um so it's it's hard enough for us with bikes <laughs> 
and it's especially in a shopping district where people are walking in and out of businesses with their packages so we support this because it, we think it's a good way for people to get around um, short distances but I really, really hope that it, it there is an actual way to use geofencing so that they cannot ride the e-scooters on the sidewalks. That's pretty much our, that's our main, that's really our only concern. Otherwise, we're good. Yeah. And I think we'll have more discussions about that with RCPD, with city staff, with everybody involved. But once again, if you're thinking about marketing anything because of businesses and the way they're at, itemize 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 COVID-19 related and just have that good to go you'll never know when you're going to need it because there's going to be three rounds of that money and you might fall into one of those categories so I just wanted to make you aware I guess I need to get some education on that because I didn't realize that it was going to be available for us yeah it'll be and there isn't much information out there so the the process is still being worked on I just wanted to put it out on your radar as you all do your accounting piece yeah to where everything's documented uh, because in the next three or four months you might be able to I don't know if you will but you might have access to some of those funds which I would certainly encourage uh, the chamber okay. to work good thank you anything else for Gina I had a quick question um, not necessarily with the e-scooters which I have questions about how those will be handled and the sanitation and all of that but um, in reference to kind of there was there's been in our bike uh, pet pedestrian plan uh, some interesting things going downtown uh, and just any feedback uh, from you while we got a chance or if you'd prefer to wait till another time I if I see more and more as somebody that lives downtown I see more and more people on bikes and uh, but at the same time it's it's difficult to navigate with and I I always think when I'm with my daughters on bikes, uh, I, your your comment about businesses being uh, a little bit hesitant because people zoom by and there's opening of doors, and so I'm thinking about that, but at the same time trying to navigate the safety of getting around on a bike downtown. I think um, I I certainly we need to have another discussion about this, um, but one thing that that will probably always be true for us. Um, we spent a lot of years and a lot of money making and creating a what a walkable district. I mean, that was really an entire district was designed and built to be this walkable district. And so a lot of infrastructure was not early on put in place to accommodate um, bikes or even e-scooters. So I think that there's, I, I'm not opposed to it, but I think that um, until there is really safe infrastructure in place, I'm not sure how you would safely navigate a lot of the downtown in the core. I mean, it is still a business district where you have the court and you know you have a, a lot of people coming and going from the grocery store at Hy-Vee and, and in and out of the mall parking lots. So it, it's, it is, it's a, a business district with a very heavily trafficked 4th Street. Um, I think Rob mentioned at one time last year that 4th Street's traffic numbers were going up. So um, I just am always concerned about infrastructure not being in place currently to handle that kind of transportation, but I'm not opposed to it. I'm sure we'll have more discussion. And, and I just also wanted to add, thank you for your input on the uh, the public art. It's been a nice addition. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I think we're going to have some some murals going up soon too. So pretty excited about that. Sounds good. Thanks a lot, Gina. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mayor. Next is the Social Services Advisory Board, and uh, Sarah Barrett, uh, Chair, will be presenting this evening. Good evening, Sarah. Good evening. Excellent. Thank you all. Um, once again, my name is Sarah Barrett, and tonight I will be sharing the 2021 funding recommendations for the Social Services Advisory Board. Uh, before we get started, I do just want to take a few moments to recognize our dedicated board members, uh, some of whom are watching tonight. 
Um, as we move forward, sorry, slide. <laughs> as we move forward in discussing uh, tonight, I wanted to give some um, background just related to what we do as a board. Um, our charge is to evaluate the general social service needs of the city and to provide an ongoing review of the agencies funded by the city in order to determine their effectiveness, their quality of service, and ongoing needs. We do this by performing site visits twice a year, generating written reports, and maintaining a close relationship with agency staff and their clients. Manhattan Social Services agencies assist individual functioning and self-sufficiency. They promote general welfare and quality of life and are, prim and are primarily engaged in providing basic human needs services such as temporary shelter, protection, nutrition, care, emergency support, and guidance to the most vulnerable members of our community. Slide. These agencies are essential and fill an undeniable gap in our community. And while providing their wide ranging and comprehensive services to clients, they must also continuously seek the necessary resources to sufficiently meet the needs of their own operations, oftentimes juggling client and staff needs, all while making very difficult decisions. Slide. Even before this year, our social service agencies were working to help community members address the following conditions, such as the um, scarcity of affordable and quality health or quality child care, a reduction in funding on an ongoing basis at the state and national level, and heavy competition for jobs. Um, and that has also been exacerbated by decreasing population coupled with an increase in needs for many of the clients that they, um, that they serve on a regular basis. Slide. However, COVID-19 has created a situation wherein the members of our community are turning to community-based social service agencies in even higher numbers um, with help for food and rent and utility assistance. Moreover, the pandemic actually shed light on the necessity of many oftentimes forgotten resources such as child care programs and even um, highlighted the need for services related to domestic and dating violence as we saw those um, rates of reports increase across the country um, as a result of the quarantine and folks being within their homes, oftentimes with their perpetrators. Our social service agencies, like all of those around the country, are seeing and will most likely continue to see a surge in the need following a widespread, um, following the widespread business and school closures and layoffs. Consistent with previous years, the board works to capture basic human needs, prevention, and community needs by, pri by prioritizing agencies by emergency and critical services. And these considerations have been delineated um, here on this slide. As you can see, the emergency and critical um, comes through to our social services uh, funding recommendations. As we think about the 2021 funding requests, we've broken those up by our emergency and then our critical uh, needs, which um, consist of prevention and intervention. And for the 2021 year, the funding requests totaled $496,865. As we think about our emergency service recommendations, we have uh, agencies like the Crisis Center, Kansas Legal Services, Manhattan Emergency Shelter Incorporated, Shepherd's Crossing, and Sunflower Casa. While our critical services consist of Big Brothers Big Sisters, Boys and Girls Club, Home Care Hospice, KSU Center for Child Development, Morning Star Incorporated CRO, and then Thrive Manhattan. On the next, on this slide, you'll actually find the allocation summary for 2020, as well as the recommendations for 2021. You will see that the difference between the amount of funding recommended versus that requested is about $19,000. Uh, our board was very intentional and as they always are and as we consider funding we really wanted to strike a balance between the ever-increasing needs of our agency uh, where we are as a society right now um, coming off of the global pandemic and then um, the ongoing social unrest but then also the budget challenges we undoubtedly face as a community next slide 
Um, here you can see the historical funding for the agencies from 2014 up and through uh, last year. And you can see consistently uh, there has been a minimal increase um, from our agencies as we think about those needs increasing not only for our clients, but also for our agencies as well. Once again, as, as a result of um, decreasing funding at various levels. For the next couple slides, uh, slide, I'll kind of review some of our agencies uh, just to ensure that we're all familiar with them. Uh, we have our crisis center, which provides 24-hour crisis intervention, counseling, and case management. Uh, it provides a self-shelter or a safe shelter for victims and their children overnight, weekends, and holidays. Uh, this is definitely once again a resource and a, a need that many communities don't necessarily have. But once again, from the pandemic really highlighting the need of having such a resource within a community that is able to meet um, you know the oftentimes very um, not necessarily apparent needs of our uh, of our families and individuals that are experiencing uh, interpersonal violence then we also have Kansas Legal Services. They provide equal litigation to support individuals um, that are unable to hire a lawyer. They provide litigation, including disability payments, child spousal support, and then guardianship as well. Next, we have our emergency Manhattan Emergency Shelter. Uh, they provide transitional shelters, supportive housing, and living stabilization services for individuals within our community. Uh, and that is really a wonderful alternative to uh, parks, sidewalks, parking lots, and abandoned buildings, aban abandoned buildings um, that many individuals without secure housing may find themselves utilizing in an effort to um, find some type of um, reprieve from the streets. We also have Shepherd's Crossing. Uh, their core services consist of rent and utility assistance to low-income residents, and uh, the majority, or not the majority, all of their funding is divided into assistance for rent and utilities. Next, we have our Sunflower Casa um, project, and they actually have many different uh, services, but uh, their core services consist of addressing child abuse, neglect, truancy, substance abuse, and divorce and custody issues. And our CASAs in our, in our community actually identify needs and make recommendations to the court, and so they serve an invaluable as an invaluable resource uh, as our court systems are making determinations of about um, the fit and the um, availability for uh, families to continue to live together or, or whether or not uh, there needs to be some intervention um, from, the, from the state. For our critical services, we have um, our Big Brothers Big Sisters and their uh, services consist of matching youth with experience that are experiencing adversity with caring adult mentors outside of their home. And the bigs themselves model healthy behaviors and offer encouragement uh, for the matches that they receive. Um, oftentimes these individuals or these youth are at risk. And then we also have our Boys and Girls Club of Manhattan. They provide a safe and positive after-school learning program um, for our for our young folks that may be latchkey kids or uh, do not have adequate adult supervision. And on a regular basis, they encourage character development, productive and positive um, positivity, and encourage uh, individuals to grow into responsible citizens that can give back to their communities. We also have our home care and hospice. Uh, they provide personal care and homemaking services to those with disabilities and chronic illnesses, and then also provide really quality, over and over we hear this, but really quality end of life care uh, to treat um, our individuals, you know, as a whole person in a really holistic way rather than just the disease. And then our K-State Child Development Center, providing affordable and accessible, high quality child care uh, for as many parents as possible uh, that are low income in our community, as well as providing quality early learning programs, which have been proven to lead to future success as adults. 
Then lastly, we have our Morningstar CRO, um, and they provide peer-to-peer -peer support for mental illness through rehabilitation and recovery. Uh, they really work uh, to empower individuals to break through the stigma of mental illness, uh, thereby increasing, uh, you know, decreasing isolation, incarceration, and hospital hospitalizations uh, that individuals might otherwise experience. And then we have Thrive Manhattan, their core services really consisting of uh, the skill building um, of and, and also relationship building in order to strengthen families and to reduce poverty and they uh, you know really focus on social capital uh, to facilitate the relationships that individuals um, and families need as they move towards prosperity in our own uh, community itself Next slide so as we think about Moving forward, we believe that we will see the following trends, a continued impact from COVID-19. I mean, I, I just think everybody has addressed that this evening. We really don't know to what extent uh, our community members will feel all the lasting effects of COVID-19. Um, we've seen so many folks already starting to seek services as our agencies reopen. And for a lot of uh, our agencies, they're seeing changing demographics in our clients. We saw that previously, but we're seeing it even more so. Um, individuals that have never sought services are beginning to now look for and utilize the services uh, offered by our, our agencies. And then lastly, some of our ongoing needs that we've discussed many years now, you know, mental health, as our community members really work to cope with the uncertainty of life, um, uncertainty related to childcare, with loss of jobs, with loss of health. Um, there's so many uh, really variables that people have to take into account right now and so ensuring that they have access to uh, affordable and then effective uh, mental health is definitely going to be something that we see moving forward and as we think about our social service agencies um, oh you can go ahead and go to the next slide thank you uh, we really want to reiterate the indelible impact of our social service agencies and their contribution to our community you know definitely i think we've seen whether through the hashtags whether through you know clapping for our essential workers and and really trying to highlight the work that is being done so often this work does go unnoticed um, but really this is a time where many folks are coming together and we're recognizing that we can't do this as individuals and that we have to rely on others and so ensuring that you know folks within our communities understand where they can go to seek those services and to be able to know that those services will exist and be funded for them to be able to support their needs is really um, is is really going to be the way that the the ripples the ongoing ripples from the wave of covid uh, will be mitigated in order to create a ripple effect that actually benefits our overall community and with that i would take any questions thank you sarah uh, good presentation yes mark Commissioner uh, two Hattie. questions sarah um, one um, were most of your agencies able to apply for the payroll protection program funds and get them because they should have been able to correct yeah, so we are in conversations with um, our different agencies to ensure that they are able to apply for and then receive those funds um, because yes, as you indicated, a lot of them do qualify and so ensuring that they understand the process and are able to navigate through that is definitely something that we're working through as a board. Good, okay. The second thing, um, during the off season when you're not in the midst of, of the rest of your uh, coming up with the allocations, um, I, I know we don't have any in the old days and I, I cut my teeth sitting at the feet of C. Clyde Jones and Edith Stunkel as people have heard me say before on social services and that was my first putting my toe in the water of public service a long time ago um, one of the things yeah, in the old days well it was always child care has always been affordable child care has always been an issue and in the old days we used to fund the Manhattan Day Care Center before that went out of business. Uh, I, I would like you to consider um, getting together with uh, small child care providers, people in their houses, people who have facilities, um, and, and find out what are the most onerous regulations 
that provide the least amount of safety um, that is driving mom and pop home child care things out of business and making institutional uh, bigger facility child care so expensive and come up with a list that we can somebody can take to the legislature to the county health lady to the regulators to somebody at the state and say this is killing affordable child care and 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 roll back nobody's advocating for dangerous child care situations but i've said before uh, there were enough regulations in place five or ten years ago to keep kids safe they don't need to keep adding more which is why yes yeah, in-house child care the most affordable way to get it people are quitting in droves because the regulations are too much and i would like us to come up with some concrete things that that child care providers say this is what's making it so expensive this is why we had to, we went out of business this is the things that we got to roll back a little bit to make make the child care part to improve that situation instead of continuously driving people out of business driving more people into more expensive places which just drops everybody else out of the bottom of the funnel as, as unable to find that child care so I, I don't know if any guys have talked about that, but that is my idea of something that could be done to come up with something that we could present, that somebody could present, uh, and then start feeding on that. Because like I said, nobody wants unsafe situations, but nobody wants situations that there's no childcare available because everybody quit providing it because it was too much of a hassle. Okay. Will do, will do. I think you definitely hit the nail on the head in a lot of different areas, you know, whether that be the regulations or um, just other challenges, those barriers in which, you know, are really stopping those folks from being able to provide those services at an affordable rate within their homes and just even a diversity of options. You know, if we don't have those offerings that really speak to the different uh, populations within our community and try to meet those needs, I think that is a disservice. So I would, I would be happy to take up that charge if you will uh, walk alongside me <laughs> once we get some, some ideas and results there. I'll do it, I'll do it for you. Right, other questions for Sarah? Yeah, I've got two quick ones. What is the actual budget request for this year? For it this year, up we... to 2020, and it just—I know you said it at the beginning, but I will pull that up. For this year, we are remaining consistent, and so it is 477,677. Okay, I just wanted to be clear, but I understood there's no increase on that, even though we've got the uh, you know issue here, the the COVID thing to deal with. Then the second question is, uh, you know, because it's not highlighted and I ask it every year, we, we've got this water bill donation thing and, and it gives you a couple of dollars. And I think, you know, when John Ball uh, was designing that, he was targeting it against uh, CIP projects that you couldn't handle through other things. So, so could you just give us an update on that? Yes, um, actually last year in my presentation, we talked through, you know, how we could highlight that and actually there's now a link on our social services advisory board page where folks can go in they can click that and make that election um, we did see a decrease over the years because for so many folks they were doing that electronic just automated and they weren't necessarily seeing the bills to encourage them to opt into it and so um, still working through how we can continue to increase awareness around that and to make that uh, an easier process for folks even as they do the you know, opt in and, and make everything electronic so that they can have that and they don't have to do a second thought. They can just have that coming out. And so I think over the years, our, our numbers have seen a decrease, but we're hopeful that as folks become more aware of it and are recognizing the need and can see the projects that are being done on a regular basis. That's something that we've recently talked about um, as a board with different board members as far as being able to share with folks explicitly, like this is where your money is going. These are the projects that have been able to be completed so that they can put those two, two things together, their funds going directly to, su to support our social service agencies. So thank you for bringing it up. Yeah, I want to just take the opportunity, everybody listening out there, you know, it's very easy, you know, on your water bill, you can just donate a dollar a month 
you know, I donate a little bit more than that because I, I pushed this years ago because I see it as an easy way to make it happen. And, and I'm a little disappointed we can't get everybody that has a water meter to just donate a dollar a month. Because if we were to do that, you know, it would generate, I think, somewhere around $130,000. And it would be a huge amount and it would be very little pain. You know, and, and you can just put it on there, you, you won't notice it. It, it. It'll just, that one dollar will come off there and, and you can do it online, the, the form is there. So, you know, if you wanna support social services and definitely this is a time they need additional support, uh, please get on your computer and push the button and donate a dollar. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions for Sarah? Sarah, I, Linda Morris, I was just going to ask you, I know that this serving on this committee uh, requires a lot of time, of your personal time, and I, uh, I, I just wonder, uh, because you actually interview each of the agencies and uh, really put your heart into it, <clears throat> um, how much time per agency do you spend? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it really depends. Um, obviously, we do our site visits, and so... Uh, that's about three hours in and of itself. We try and give over an hour to not only go through our um, questions as far as you know, regular questions that we ask every single agency, but we also do tours for our new members. We're constantly bringing on new folks and then having folks uh, cycle off um, and then inviting you know, very passionate and, and concerned community members. You know, I spoke about this last year, but you taking the time out of your schedule to come in and to visit with some of our agencies these was very meaningful and you know I think it provides a different perspective not only for the attendee but for our agency uh, staff members to have an understanding you know not only of the the questions and the perceptions from our board members but also from our community members as far as you know how their services are perceived and the impact that they're having and so in addition to the the regularly scheduled site visits you know we spend time writing the reports following the site visits and then we also just spend time supporting our services whether it's a fundraiser that they have going on um, and then just even connecting with them on a regular basis so you know for our our board it is it is definitely a, a labor of love and um, a service to the community that they think is essential and, and something that they're willing to do so I would just um, um, say you know as far as the time commitment it may it may pale in comparison to some other boards um, but definitely for our members they are spending a good amount throughout each month working in um, working in support of our our agencies I think that we appreciate what you're doing I'd like to thank you uh, and if you would share that with the rest of the board members when you meet um, it, it's such an important uh, role that we it's a for us to uh, for you as a board and and the community to help those that are less fortunate so um, we have at least we have a, a good organized system and uh, I wish the money could go up but <laughs> we'll probably have trouble making that uh, even goal this year but thank you so much appreciate it thank you Sarah, I have a couple of questions. Um, you know, we had talked earlier this afternoon about some of the um, some of the discussion that's going to be happening this evening. But I was wondering, as I'm looking at your classification of emergency and classification of critical, why is Morningstar and Care uh, Home Care and Hospice not part of emergency? Um, because I think there's a lot of mental health issues right now and uh, as well as for home care and hospice, the needs are enormous at this time. Um, what does, how did you designate them to be critical as opposed to emergency? And I know that was very difficult. I will not deny <laughs> that because I think all of them should be an emergency. But I was wondering about Morningstar and home care and hospice. That's a great question and something that we've wrestled with quite a lot as a board. And ultimately we've come down to, you know, for the, the critical, we really see that as the prevention and the intervention. And so definitely with Morningstar, while the needs of the individual seeking those services sometimes may be in an a, a emergency state, for the most part, the support, um, the 
just really community building that is happening there is really seen as a, a prevention mechanism to ensure that the folks are getting that care, that getting that ongoing um, support from their peers, getting access to different resources within the community as they are transitioning out of hospitalization or out of incarceration or maybe out of a, a period wherein um, they were seeking some of those emergency care um, services. And so, you know, for us, it is, it is a really difficult determination as we try and break that up. And then, you know, the same for our home care and hospice. For a lot of these individuals, we're trying to do preventative care to be able to keep them in their homes or to keep them as independent as possible. And so ensuring that we have funding for our healthcare attendants to be able to go and support them. And then also ultimately that transition out of, um, you know, that more uh, chronic um, ongoing health deterioration as they make that transition to end of life um, to really provide that that service more um, out of compassion rather than an emergent need. Yeah, I think just for my own state of mind, I might classify them as emergency. I think with the uh, Morning Star, I know, you know, there have been times when uh, individuals have to be taken to the stabilization center or hospital or, you know, are on that suicide kind of, you know, tilting one way or another. And uh, home care and hospice, when I talk to them this afternoon, you know, that Meals on Wheels and making sure they're making their doctor's appointments in these uh, time of need. But either way, that's a judgment call, and I completely understand that. Uh, we certainly value all the work uh, that your committee has put into this, and um, your advisory recommendations are very critical to our decision making. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you all. You know, I wanted to mention on that priority list, I really appreciate that because I'm probably the guilty party that pushed that for many years and, and I was the one that actually wanted you to list them one through 10. And, and I think, uh, you know, the group came up with a very nice compromise on putting together the packet you had. And I did that because, you know, I'm a, I've always said, you know, it's about priorities. You can't always fund everything. You don't have the resources. And so you've got to decide, you know, what is more critical than the other. And that's not to say that, you know, something's not valuable. But you, but you have to categorize it, and I really appreciate the effort and thought that went into that. So thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I have a question. Yes, Sarah. Um, on the big brothers and big sisters difference of the, they had the largest difference in requested and approved. Um, what what was that seven thousand? Just to just to since somebody might be interested in helping them out somewhere that's not from the city. Yeah. You know, as we try and discern the needs and, you know, at what to what extent we can fund folks, we take a lot of different things into consideration. And so there was a time in which um, we felt as though, you know, in conversation with the staff members, there was a, a, a lapse in time where there was, um, you know, a staff member kind of leading here in the Manhattan area. And then as far as meeting their goals, because we speak with our every single agency and we say, what are your goals? Have you met those goals? How do you intend to continue meeting those goals? And what additional goals have you set moving forward and so there was some discrepancy between the goals that they had set and then where they actually landed and so recognizing that there are many different factors and, and reasons as to why that happened um, but also taking into account that you know the, the pot is limited and so ensuring that you know for our folks that are meeting their goals and are doing what they say that they're going to do um, that we're able to fund them in a way that is appropriate and we shared that with them as far as how that decision making um, was happening and then even scheduled up some follow-up because it is important for us to be essentially almost like that compliance body to ensure that you know folks are util utilizing the funds that you all are um, making such difficult decisions about in the way that they say that they will all right thank you it sounds like it was it was for personnel additional personnel time okay and just the lack the lack of um, matches at the level that they um, originally intended and like I told you earlier this afternoon, you know, I keep talking about the Spark COVID fund funding that will come towards Riley County. Nonprofits will be eligible for that as well. Anything related to COVID-19 should be documented 
uh, just for uh, when that call comes along that you have it at your hands. We will send all of that out once we have more information ourselves. But I just wanted to put it out there on everybody's radar this evening. Thank you so right. much. Thanks a lot, Sarah. I appreciate your time. No. Our last presenter is the Special Alcohol Committee Chair, uh, Jardine Coleman, and uh, the Special Alcohol Fund. Hi, Jardine. Is Jardine here? I am here. I was muted. Sorry. <laughs> there you go. Zoom problems. Okay. Um, my name is Jardine Coleman, and I am the chair of the Special Alcohol Fund Advisory Board. Um, I worked with our staff liaison um, on our presentation tonight, and we decided to keep it short and sweet because we always follow SSAB, and they do such an incredible job of giving you an overview of almost all of the agencies that we uh, both work with. And so we decided not to provide you with a PowerPoint um, reviewing that same information. And we really just wanted to get to the numbers tonight because that's what's most important. Um, I will start by saying, I mean, I've, I've been on this call for a little over an hour already, and I'm aware that um, all aspects of Manhattan are being affected by COVID-19 and we are not any different. Um, our fund depends on the um, special tax that is on um, caterers and clubs and establishments that sell uh, drinks by the drink. And so with having businesses shut down, um, we're seeing that affect our funds that we have available. And so what we decided to do um, was to honor um, all of the same amounts that we allocated uh, for the 2020 budget that we did um, in 2021, unless an agency asked specifically for less money, then we went with that lesser amount, um, which is the case for Riley County um, Community Corrections Juvenile Services. They decreased our request, and so we matched that. We did have one agency that did not request funds in, um, for 21, and that was Wonder Workshop. Um, our deadline for our application fell right around the time that we lost Richard Pitts. And so um, we spoke to their board and they just weren't able to get the application in, but we encouraged them to return for future years because we were all very excited to be able to um, fund um, some personnel and some activities for that agency. So we hope that they can return. Um, there was a, a total amount requested for the 2021 year was $632,342. And what we approved uh, for allocation was $471,300. And again, that difference is noted because we had uh, one agency ask for less funding than they did last year. And we also had one agency that did not um, apply again this year. So that's why that number is lower. Um, I didn't provide you with our projections, but looking forward, we are projecting to have a decrease in our funds uh, for 2022. Um, and so we are sort of in a wait and see um, to see how the rest of the quarters out, or the year's quarters allocations shake out for us. Um, we really can't predict what will be available. Um, and our agencies are aware that we are limited in what we can um, provide as far as um, when our allocations come in, we can only give what we have, and they understand that because that's a part of our contract that they sign with us. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you guys had about our funding decisions or about the committee. Old, old Doc Hattisall here. Yes. Uh, Jardine, is, uh, refresh my memory, is, is most of the money that goes to the school district, is that for social workers or what is what, yes, what, that's a great that? question. Um, so it actually funds a particular position at the school district. Um, it is a special um, drug and alcohol social worker, and she serves K-12. Um, and we are having some conversations in the committee about um, if we want to continue to be the primary funding source for any one agency's program. And the school district has historically had a pretty significant chunk of our funds. And um, quite frankly, we're getting some pushback from our other agencies as to why that is. 
And so we're trying to figure out how do we balance that request with their needs that we have across the board. Yeah, I was thinking it used to be two or three or, or more positions than, than a position and affiliated expenses. And so I, I just wanted to get a new update as to how that was allocated that way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I concur with Mark on that. That one always seemed like uh, you know, a huge amount of the of the of the money that comes out of there. But I, I appreciate the, the the work that the board does, and of course, this one is one where it's sort of unique because your your budget is just driven by you know those tax receipts. It's not something that really the commission controls at all. It, it's like you know here's what you get depending upon the the spending habits of the population. And so I think it's, uh, you know, th this board is an, is an exact, excellent example of, you know, taking uh, the citizens and letting them decide what to do with that money. And, and I always find it, you know, uh, very comfortable uh, what the board presents. And the only other thing that's of interest, and we've, we've said this years before, you know, there's about five agencies there that are duplicated between Social Services Advisory Board and the Special Alcohol Fund. And, and I trust you're you're looking at that so that you know you don't get an excessive amount going to one group or the other. I don't know if that plays into the determinations of either board or not, but I know we've discussed it each year. But uh, but definitely appreciate the work uh, everybody does on this particular board. Thank, thank you, me. thank you, and I appreciate you pointing out that our funding is is always up in the air because that is always a challenge with this board. We really can't come to you and ask you to give us anything more than what we have. <laughs> so. We're just trying to figure out what to do with what we have. It's it's always hard. Thank you, Jordan. Jordan, can you tell me a little bit about Friends of Recovery Association? I remember yes. talking about this in the past, but then I just kind of lost it. And now yes. I know it's 15 again, and it's five. Friends of Recovery um, is the Oxford House program. So it's a sober living program. Um, and they have... Um, one Oxford House that is um, women, and I believe that they have opened up a second that is women and children. Um, and we have, over the last few years, we've really pushed them um, about meeting their goals, exactly what Sarah was talking about. So they've had a goal to open up another Oxford House, and they weren't meeting that goal for a while, and so we decreased their funding. Um, and so they're slowly moving um, in that direction to get in and to maintain that other home, um, which is challenging because it's up to the residents. It's it's fully run by um, people who are sober. And so they make their own house rules. Um, and it's a matter of everyone being on the same page and contributing. And that's sort of what keeps the house open. And is that a national program? I'm not sure. Okay. I know that it's um, in different places in Kansas. Yeah, I think this is one of those easy one, easy, because you know you, you have this much money. And I do hope Wonder Workshop comes back, and I think they're kind of um, wondering where they want to go with the Wonder Workshop as well. But yes. yeah, made some good decisions, and um, we will continue that discussion. Thank you for all the effort all your entire advisory board has put into this. We appreciate it. Yes, thank you, and thank you for appointing Scott to our advisory board. We're excited to have another member join us. Good. <laughs> so the more the merrier. Yes, always. Any other questions for Jardine? Jardine, just thank you. Linda Morris, Jardine, thank you for the effort of your entire committee. It is a passion and time consuming. I do have a question about the social worker. Is that really a total of $190,000 though? For so it's not it's it's not just her position. I believe okay. it also is about the curriculum that she provides. So all the okay. programming that she does is also a part of that. And could be multiple people then with part time part, part, part of her of team. Time. Yeah, but it's yeah, but she's the yeah. only actual yeah. social worker. Okay, thank you. Good question. Thank you for uh -huh. letting yeah. me clarify uh -huh. that. Oh yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jardine. Um, we do have, uh, I think, the Wolf House, but they sent us a letter, uh, a document for, for their funding. Um, okay, with that, uh, commissioners, we can have our conversation. Jason, is there anything else you wanted to add or any of our city staff? Not at this time, Mayor. Uh, we are meeting next Tuesday to talk uh, broader 
conversation on the general fund. So <clears throat> quite a bit of what you're considering tonight uh, is impacted by our transient guest tax forecast, which is on the July 14th uh, work session schedule. So we'll jump into the CVB and transient guest tax discussion at that point as well. We'll have to circle back on uh, some of these entities uh, and the forecast for 2021 uh, especially as it pertains to TGT and, and develop a game plan on how you want to handle those. Sounds good. Ron, did you want to say something? You're on mute. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think your point that uh, I think there is an opportunity for several of these agencies uh, to uh, possibly benefit from uh, some of the spark funds that uh, will be coming. Uh, there's also an opportunity for some of them to uh, possibly look at some of our uh, CDBG funds uh, that uh, we have, the CARES money that we got from that. And I know uh, Eric and his staff in community development have uh, reached out to several of those uh, for that process. So uh, those, that's another avenue that we can look at meeting some of the increased demand. Uh, obviously, a lot of these uh, agencies that have had uh, fundraising events during this time have been very difficult for them to be able to do that if not impossible and so uh, that'll be the challenge and how do how do they get those revenues so if we can look at other alternative forms to reimburse them for the other expenses that they've had I think that will be uh, important going forward I agree I think when I was talking to uh, Sarah Barrett, uh, I believe she talked, she mentioned to me Kansas Legal Services uh, about rent and COVID-19 and such. And I think anything impacted with such things, you know, if one of our staff members such as Eric or somebody can loop back around to them, especially for some of those items such as rent, because they're looking into 2021 and 2022 and we don't know what those are going to look like but this is as we look at the COVID-19 funding sources like I said itemize 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 everything this, uh, including rent and PPE and all of these things technology software if they're having to take uh, you know more patients or patients if uh, individuals in uh, home care and hospice need to go to more doctor's appointments or more meals on wheels or rotating their staff and employees and things of that sort. So. I do think uh, we can try to work on a form that will ask uh, pertinent questions that uh, makes it easier for them to help determine to qualify. I think the county's consultant can help us in this regard uh, and we can look at some of the other uh, uh, communities that are, are working on this sort of thing to uh, learn from that as well. So. Uh, appreciate uh, uh, all of the work as, as you indicated that uh, uh, these uh, great agencies are doing that for our community. Thank you. I think the Linda Morris, I think the real one of the real tests coming up is the quick turnaround that's going to be required uh, to apply for some of the spark funds or some of the other opportunities. So they need to be working now to identify the, the cost and um, so that when they get the guidelines, they can plug it in really quick and, and make the application final. Uh, that's gonna be critical because the SPARC funds are short, have a short time, short fuse. Agree. I'm, I'm concerned about the quick turnaround that we're gonna have to do from the time we actually get in a guesstimate as to how much money is out there and then how quickly we're gonna have to whittle that down or or so come July 14th, 28th, those those couple of dates that, um, yeah, since everything's sort of getting pushed back, decisions are getting pushed back because we don't know anything yet. Um, yeah, we're just gonna, and we're not gonna have a lot of time ourselves based on the budget schedule to kind of work through these some of these last tough decisions there. So yeah, there's a lot of last minute cramming gonna have to happen on a lot of these things apparently. And, and we've been talking with the chamber as well as Ron. Uh, when did you want to add something? I, I just want to make four comments. Okay, go ahead. Okay. When you're done. I'm done. Okay, just, you know, just general. As I, as I look at this, you know, we discussed outside agencies and, and I still don't like the way we categorize it because 
you know, outside agencies like the library, RCPD, and the MPO, we have no control on their budget, and, and neither does the city manager. They get dictated to us because the library's got charter ordinance. They can spend up to six mils. The law board gives you the RCPD, the RCPD budget, and, uh, you know, the MPO gives us theirs. And so that's sort of off the table. Then we got, you know, special alcohol board. And, and again, we don't control that either. It's the amount of money that gets uh, brought in by the liquor sales. And that's taken care of. So what it boils down to is we're talking about, you know, the special alcohol board, Manhattan Arts Center, the Wolf House, DMI, and the Aggieville Business District. Now, I've always pushed for years that, you know, we shouldn't put more than one mil in property taxes on outside agencies. Okay, but of course that never included RCPD or the library because they're in a different thing. And one mil is about, you know, $585,000 somewhere, somewhere in there. And the SSAB is below that, but then if you add, you know, MAC, the Wolf House, DMI, and the business districts, it, it, it's gonna exceed that. And so we've always supplemented that as Jason brought out by the transit guest tax, but, but that looks a bit grim this year. And then the only other source is, uh, you know, the economic development fund. Now, now in my mind, you know, I'm all about prioritizing things and I, I don't want to see DMI go away. I don't want to see the Aggieville Business District going away. So they're high on my list on the economic recovery. So we've got to figure out, you know, how to fund that. And, and I've sent some emails back because I got some requests from Manhattan Arts Center. The two lowest things on my priority list are in fact the Manhattan Arts Center and the Wolf House. And if we have to cut funds, I'd cut all their funds all the way down to zero. And I donated to both of them during the you know Green Grow Match Day at the Greater Manhattan Community Foundation. So I'm not anti those agencies, but when you gotta make tough decisions, you gotta make tough decisions. And you gotta have a list, who's at the top, who's at the bottom. And then the, the encouraging thing is what, what you just said, Ron, if we can legally funnel as much of that spark money community development block grants money to these agencies so we can make them all whole I'm all for that but when you start you know reaching in the wallet and handing out the cash when you run out you've got to decide which ones are not going to get the money and and that's basically I think what Mark was alluding to we're gonna have to make that decision and and I've already got you know my priority list and I sort of explained that so, so I wanted to be sure the staff uh, you know understood that and the transient guest tax, it's gonna to be tough because I think we've got to balance, you know, what the chamber wants, what the two business district wants. And I've always seen them as, you know, being a team effort to make it work. And uh, hopefully uh, we, we can work together and, and keep all three of them whole. Thank you, Ben. Other comments for, for this discussion? Yes, Mark. Yeah, uh, Commissioner Hassel again. One of the things that it, this year is such a conundrum of, of differences. There's um, people, have been, a, a lot of the not-for-profits um, have lost their fundraising event because of, of the lockdown and various things like that. Some of them will try to push things back to the fall, do them virtual or online. Um, but on the other hand, um, looking at my leaderboard from the Grow Green Match Day, um, you take out the COVID recovery fund and the next, the top five uh, Grow Green um, agencies were all Shepherd's Crossing, Crisis Center, Bread Basket, Home Care Hospice, and the Emergency Shelter. Most likely, uh, easily their best year ever since pretty much everybody on Grow Green had the best year ever because it was $300,000 or $400,000 more than it ever had been. So there's, they, there's more money at sort of, they've gotten sort of more money through the Grow Green, the match, and I saw that uh, the Community Foundation also gave uh, uh, 20,000 bucks to Shepherd's Crossing from their, um, I think from the, oh, from the COVID-19 recovery fund. And so I would like, yeah, um, the community, I like what the Community Foundation is doing to help out with some of that stuff. And I would like to hope that, that they can, can continue to step forward potentially as the year goes on to help fill in a little bit more of the gaps um, to maybe even help out a little bit more for next year on some of these agencies that 
that may end up not getting as much uh, city money as, as they have requested. Uh, I don't know where that's going to end up because we got to wait to see where our, our balances are in July here. But um, that is one of the things that we, we want to remember is that uh, um, a lot of the agencies had really good years on Grow Green and they got the money that they could spend right away, not just the part that uh, part of it. And so that will help a little bit. But I understand, on the other hand, they've lost a lot of their fundraising capabilities. So that may be all a wash and there may not actually be uh, sort of any extra money by the time you get to um, what they've lost plus what they're getting um, from the private sector. And so they're, yeah, that's something I'm gonna kind of like to keep an eye on a little bit as, as, as we get closer to the budget deadline is, um, and next time I talk to Vern Hendricks, I'll see if they've got a small pile of money sitting around that they don't have designated for something that they could maybe divvy up to some of these agencies either for next year um, or even a little bit this year to maybe provide a little carryover in case we don't have as much for next year. Thank you, Commissioner. Other comments before we jump in? Okay, uh, well, I'll chime in a little bit here. Um, and I, uh, I, you know, I have no problem with the DMI or Aggieville Business District. I think that's something we're gonna to continue to work with them on. Uh, being business districts as well as other business districts in our community that's one of the prime aspects to get our get our economy back because we rely so much on sales sales tax revenue so it's in our best interest to help them out as much as possible in this process um, the social services i understand what the greater manhattan community foundation is doing and i think that will be helpful to the social service agencies uh, but this is the time we also know that most of those social service agencies are run by just a handful of staff and lots of volunteers and uh, most of those volunteers are usually um, either retired or uh, are just you know trying to um, fill in some time so that they can help out the community but that has not been as effective these days because of all of the uh, social distancing and all of this we had to do so a lot a fewer people are having to pick up a larger load of that work for, for some very vulnerable and needy populations and I think this is the time um, <clears throat> that they probably need this funding more than ever before not only for fundraising efforts but because the challenges they themselves are facing uh, I, when I was talking to a couple of them, uh, they were worried about their employees that may have come in contact that had COVID-19, but their employees can't get tested because they're not showing any symptoms. So their employees have to take 14 days off just in case anything happens or unless they get. So when you take, a, if you have five employees and two or three have to, can't come in because they don't have symptoms, but they think they came in contact, that reduces um, you know, fewer people, but the workload does not reduce. So I think this is the time we need to continue to make sure people are getting to their doctor's appointments, are getting their needs met, whether it's uh, mental well-being or for their child care, uh, for their legal services. Domestic abuse uh, is still happening. Crisis uh, center is still seeing a lot of people. They still need money to make sure they're taking care of some of them, especially now that more people are at home. Uh, so things, uh, you know, things are, are increasing. The needs are increasing. Uh, so when we start discussing the budget in whole, I'm sure we will have further um, discussions when we see all of the numbers come together at one time. That's my take on this. Okay. Mayor so Linda, Linda Morris, I too feel like I need to know more. Uh, I can't come up with a magic anything right now because we uh, don't have a more complete revenue picture and we don't, um, you know, there's, there are going to be some sacrifices and we're going to have to pick very carefully. And so it's uh, kind of up in the air. And if we're not going to be doing some of these things until July, then there's not much. I want to take it all in at this point, but I'm not ready to um, make a determination. Right. And we also have to keep in mind any kind of CDBG funds or CARES Act funds or the SPARC COVID-19 funds that they're probably going to be utilized for 2020, uh, not budgeting for 2021. So that would be a different uh, area for direct aid we would be looking at as opposed to filling the gap for what else they already spent since COVID-19 started. So we're looking at a couple of 
uh, at least two or three different factors when we look at what are they going to be getting and what does that mean to our budget. Um, so again, uh, lots of discussions to be had. Any other comments? Mayor, I'll just, uh, this Commissioner Esterbrook, real quick, um, kind of jogged my, my uh, thinking in the sense of when we talk about business associations and we have Aggieville, we have downtown, uh, we don't we don't see requests and we don't often hear about but the West Loop Business Association and just in that that sense of when Gina mentioned oh, I wasn't aware you know about the spark and the information that goes out I think there's there's some businesses over on that side it has nothing to do with this other than you sparked my uh, remembrance of the West Loop Business Association so uh, I wanted to give that uh, a shout out too I guess And Ron and the Chamber and all of these businesses, we will try to send out as much information as possible. I think that also falls on the county. My understanding is they just, uh, the State Executive Committee, Spark Executive Committee, just finalized their resolution. The counties have to sign on to it. And I think one of those, two of those sections are very pertinent to our discussion because they have to make a way for the city, municipalities, and school district, ed public education entities to receive some of those funds and they hired a consultant, which is great. So these are discussions we're going to have on top of our own budget discussions. So we need to um, really be very focused uh, for the next few months, well, next six months. I would agree to that. And, and you know, certainly it's our intent to distribute that information as broadly as possible. I know that's the county's intent. Also, uh, keeping in mind this is gonna come in three waves and, and and so the first wave is really focused more on taxing jurisdictions which could include how we help some of our agencies that we typically help uh, and organizations. Uh, but those same folks would also be eligible in phase two and three as could we be in a public-private partnership component. It sounds like phases two and three are gonna be more of a first come first serve uh, on the, the funds that, that are available. So uh, there's, there's a lot out there. I think our biggest challenge uh, will be trying to determine uh, what are those, those future preventative costs that we uh, might come up with for a resurgence. Um, and that's something that's really gonna take some time and, and groups to, to really put their heads together and figure out that we can be better prepared for uh, for all of us, uh, public and private sector, uh, in the event of a resurgence, and what do we need on hand to, to uh, be more successful in, in meeting that challenge? Right, I agree. Lots of discussions, um, testing being one. Uh, but either way, before we dive, dig into all of that, this is not <laughs> for that. But uh, if there are no other comments, uh, I can adjourn the meeting. Okay, seeing no more comments, we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.